questions. All right, so let's get this program started uh, this morning with a key builder on the XRP ledger that you should all know. Witsawind of the XRPL Labs is one of the earliest and most prolific builders on the XRP Ledger uh, in the force behind the Zaman wallet. Today, he's going to talk to you about everything XRP Ledger and how he evangelizes it. Over to Vitsa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here, crawling out of bed. Early morning, after a great party, I've been told. I'm uh, excited to be here, excited that you're all here, and mostly excited that this, this, this small XRPL geeky crowd turned out to be a seven, 800 people event, person event. So thanks for being here. I am, um, I'm gonna present something that might be a little bit tricky if you read it at first. It's the, the blockchain no one knows about. It's a little bit of a different angle than some of you might expect, so don't, don't be afraid. So I'm going to take you back uh, a couple of years, just because I, I know a lot of people here are, are considered personal friends after all these years. There are also plenty of people new here, which is great. It means the space is expanding, but not everyone might be aware what we've been doing. So I'm Vitsa. I'm the founder of XRPL Labs. We've been building XRPL things for, uh, for many years, more than five years. Which, uh, which isn't even the first generation of builders. There are people here in the, in the room who've been building basically when I was still in diapers, or that's what it feels like. Good to see those people here as well. Um, I, I, I stumbled upon the XRPL in 2016 when I saw a presentation by David Swartz. And he was, I mean, David is a great guy, right? He's talking passionately about this technology and a, a different approach to some of the things some of us already saw with, with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, for example, and, and other blockchain technologies. And he was very passionate about a different approach to using uh, these technologies, this, this paradigm, and implementing it. And I started playing with it, uh, had success after seven minutes, uh, four second transaction finality, which today might not feel like crazy, amazing four seconds. There are other chains to do that. But this is, this is 2016. This was new and it was so easy. It was and that's, that's, that's still relevant and still unique today. It was a well-documented, standardized API. I didn't have to install all kinds of weird tools to use this technology. It was what's available in every web browser, on every client using standardized APIs. Just plugged in, seven minutes later, I broadcasted the transaction straight from my web browser. And four seconds later, I realized someone else at the other side of the world would have finality, would have a confirmed transaction. Unique, still unique today. And this was 2016, and then consider that the technology was created maybe 14 years ago. So crazy. So what are you going to do if you have access to such a great technology? You're going to, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a builder, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're creative, and I, we're, on, we're at, an, at an event where everyone is, right? So you're going to find something, a small hobby project you're going to work on, you want to work on it in your spare time. You need to put this technology to use. So I started to play around, building some libraries here and there, found a community on Twitter, on Discord, things were scattered. And it was interesting because this 2016, 2017, 2017, we had a great boom of people entering the crypto space, specifically the XRPL, which was for speculative reasons, but it brings a very good thing as well. Um, I'm not, not saying speculation is bad, we have to deal with it, it's part of this space, but the interesting thing is if you bring a whole lot of people to this space, for whatever reason, you're going to bring geeks as well, you're going to build creative people as well, you're going to bring builders, and these people, they stay around. And these people probably notice the same things I noticed when I first looked at the XRP Ledger, that it's a great technology to build on. That is very comprehensible, that you have a quick success, that it's powerful, that it's not some kind of weird Web3 quirky environment where you have to fully dive in, learn new terminology. Everyone understands a JSON object and everyone understands what a payment is. You can just use it. So there was, this was a great time actually because you saw a lot of good vibes, people actually building things, users building it. And, there was a large audience of users as well, because they all came to the space, were excited, were uh, willing to play, play with the technology. So we, we saw 
a new world where we can just uh, f around and find out and have fun and build things, excitement. And uh, I, I realized I, I wanted to build something that could be used by many people because I saw a technology that you can actually use in a large, maybe even retail space. So I wanted to build something that would leverage the things that the XRPL already had all these years back, still unique today, a native decentralized exchange, the native possibility to issue currencies, the native opportunity to do scaling related things like payment channels, to do multi-siding, again, native, still unique today, interesting to build on. And what I, what I ended up building was something that, that would amplify the fun of a community. I built the XRP tipbot, and some of, some of you even used it. It's funny, all those years later that we still look at that and you think, you know, the, the project from 2017, we want it back. It's, it's no longer really viable today, regulatory landscape changed, and that's, that's fine, but it was a fun project. So I look at that phase, 2016, 17, 18, as the, the, crawling, the crawling phase. And Brett Garlinghouse said something, I believe it was in 2019. Brett Garlinghouse said, you have to crawl before you walk, before you run. And if you apply that to the title of my presentation, I think we can start to see what running looks like. If five years ago we were crawling, we're just having fun, building weird things, excitement, but it was kind of geeky, right? And, and it was kind of unusable unless you, if you were in the space. And if today is walking, and it means that a, a larger audience can use your products and that the technology, I mean, we all established, I think the entire space, even outside of the space, the world established that the space we're in is here to stay around. So we can, we can actually build things for users. Um, and then I want to take a look at what, what, what running looks like. And I, I, I hope I can, um, I can inspire all of you to, to look at everything you're going to build from that perspective, how, if I, if I build something, how can we run with it? So XRP Tibot, which is a crazy project. People could send small tips to each other, small gifts. It was very, very easy to use, which led to way more adoption than I expected. Uh, within, I believe a little over a year, people transferred 2 million USD in value on social networks by sending a small tip, small gift. And I think the success of the XRP tip bot was that it was very easy to use. It was just a comment. You just replied, I'm going to give you a couple of XRP. Um, and, 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 and later on, even other assets issued on the XRPL. The interesting thing is that you could send it to anyone. People didn't have to be onboarded in the ecosystem. There would be a gift, value, waiting for them. They had a fun incentive to join the ecosystem. And then when you join the ecosystem, and there's a little bit of value, which was free because someone liked your tweet, then you might as well pay it forward, right? So it grew organically because it was easy, because it was fun, because it was something not for a small bunch of crypto geeks. It was something for everyone, everyone on social media. So that's when we realized that things had to be easier as well, right? This is 2017 and everything was a push payment. Even a tip on a social network was a push payment. I decide that I'm going to send something to you. And if you look at the world around us, it's not really based on push payments. Everything is pool. Almost everything is pool. I am in a store. I want to buy pants. The store now wants something for me. They want to be paid so I can take the pants. If I'm going to watch movies, I have to pay a subscription. They want me to pay a subscription. They know the amount. They know the currency they want to receive. They know everything. They just want me to pay that. And this makes perfect sense, right? We're doing this all the time. And even in 2016, 17, we were doing this all the time. This is, this is how retail works. You're in a store. They want you to pay. Well, first we swipe the card, then we dip the card, now we have a contactless payment. But why didn't blockchains offer this? And this is 2017, so Wallet Connect didn't even exist, right? So here we were, having fun, realizing that if we, if we wanted to have more than just fun, if we wanted to build something everyone can use, 
we're going to need to introduce something uh, that offers pool payments to the ecosystem. So what we, what we did, what we set out to do in 2017, and I think we, uh, we, we fully, fully realized that, we built pool payments for the, for, for the blockchain, for the XRPL specifically. Very simple, small payload, you request something, can be delivered using any channel, right? Can be a deep link on smartphone, QR scan, push notification, anything. User swiped right, it's okay. Payment gets sent over blockchain. It's messaging. It's just a handshake. And um, we built this, and I'm very proud to be able to say that this is basically the standard now in the entire ecosystem. This is how people interact. This is what every platform, what every project, what every web app, what everyone integrates. And this is what every user uses. And the reason why it's so easy is that the, the projects can build without having to worry about key management and the users can interact with every project without having to worry about their security. Now, we were obviously not the only ones with this idea, right? This exists everywhere. It already existed in the normal payment space. We have Wallet Connect right now, which is cross-chain and interoperable. But, but I think this is, this is the start of walking. This is where we stood up. This is where we stopped crawling, where we stopped copy-pasting secret keys into another app. This is where we started to walk. So, if we're walking today, we can see, we start to see what running looks like. And I think the entire space woke up and there's a lot of focus on what, what should be running. And the first, so the first things are, are pretty visible. There's the, the decentralized recovery alliance, great initiative. A couple of things you notice here. One, no tribalism. These are different blockchain ecosystems working together on technology to make this entire space a better place for end users. What the Decentralized Recovery Alliance does, and we're, we're a proud founding member, um, we, we, we tackle the, uh, the key recovery problem, right? It's not acceptable if we want to grow as a space to say, well, uh, if you lose your secret key, too bad, right? Part, you, want, you wanted self-custody? Comes with self-custody. You should take better care of your key. Unacceptable. Not going to help us with any rollout of this technology. So... Um, at the same time, in a space where your voice can be cloned for $2 by AI, where we can have video calls with each other and we aren't even ourselves because we get an overlay over our face, we need to look at the hybrid between technology, new technology, blockchain, and very old traditional ways of doing business or, or interacting. You go to each other. Physically, you're in the same room, you're next to each other, and you vouch for each other, and you get access to your account if you do this a couple of times, right? I go to a colleague, a colleague says, yes, you're you. I go to my mom, mom says, yes, you're you. And with a certain threshold, I regain access to my account. Very, very important. It's even, even, even the, traditional, the traditional way of doing things, if you, if you lose your bank card, you go back to the bank, probably. You, may, you might do it online, which is dangerous again, and you see the problems, but you, you go back to a bank, and you're you, you identify yourself, you regain access. We should make this that simple in the crypto space to do this and to prevent people from burning themselves. And that's, that's in-person interactions to regain access to very modern technology. Another thing we see is more retail-like focus, right? So it's interesting. We're here at, at this event organized by Ripple, and, and Ripple is doing a great job at um, uh, attacking the, the enterprise space. At the same time, a lot of people here are builders looking at, 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 at facing retail users, end users, um, and, and we should attack both. If not, we should attack all these different angles at the same time, and we'll meet somewhere in the middle, right? This technology can be used for, for all of this. I see a lot of people here in the room today, and I've interacted with a lot of people who have a more, more user-centric focus, end-user-centric focus, and we have to realize, and you see that the industry is, is going in that direction, we have to realize that the end-user is not a blockchain enthusiast, it's not a Web3 geek. The end-user is anyone. My mother should be an end-user. She doesn't even know how to use her phone. She should still be able to leverage this technology without even realizing it. So we see better user interfaces. We see a better user experience. We see uh, builders slowly changing their terminology, right? It even goes to the words we use. And, 
and the way we allow builders to build uh, uh, more exciting things and better things also means that the entire developer experience has to improve. If you're a developer, you're not familiar with the Web3 space today, and you want to build something in a Web3 in, in a Web3 environment, and you want to do something, something you you imagine that isn't possible in using just the standard, you're going to write smart contracts, right? And what we see today is smart contracts are important. Smart contracts are so important that today we're no longer at an XRPL blockchain event. We're in a multi-chain environment. We're in a multi-chain space. We're talking about side chains and we're, we're talking about the XRPL and an EVM side chain. So you can do more, so you can do different things. We have to make doing different things really easy as well. We're creative people. We want to attract more creative people. We want to build things we envision that don't exist yet, which means you need to have all the building blocks and all the freedom to build what you want in the most easy way possible. Because if you want to build something, um, if, if, if you want to build something new, and first you have to study for days and learn new terminology, you won't feel success the first evening you're starting on your side project. You're overwhelmed. So one of the things we're doing is we're bringing um, smart contracts to the native XRPL protocol. It's called Hooks. Uh, and, and we're now adding a JavaScript runtime as a smart contract language to the chain. And I'd, I'd like, I mean, I just, I just mentioned terminology. We shouldn't even call them smart contracts. Why are we talking about smart contracts? This is a rule engine. This is logic you deploy to the network. So the network can enforce some things your application needs. And this is important because this allows us to do new things, but this is also important. And if, I mean, it's, it's very clear, we're here to stay. The environment is regulated, it's gonna be more regulated. End users become more important, are, are most important, I'd say. And end users need some protections. They need it because otherwise we're not going to have success in this space. If we want to protect end users, we need to do things in the most simple possible, possible way to protect them, which means the average if-else routine is more than enough. If the sender of a payment is on an X number of advisory blacklists, why not block it or allow the user to decide that they want to block it, right? Or if, if someone just wants an easy interaction with the network and there are all kinds of complex payment types or transaction types the user has no interest in, unless maybe they, they opt in, then why not block it? Spam. Let's filter it out before it even happens, right? Key recovery mechanisms by storing little pieces of data on the chain, why not make it really easy? So this is... This is quite exciting. Uh, we're, we're making it very easy for developers to build new things as well, natively on the XRPL protocol. Uh, you, see, you see a small example here. And uh, I guess this is the, the public announcement of us now finally being ready to give developers access to this technology. I will share more examples and um, like a local development sandbox later today on social media. So this is walking. I want to go to running. I'm going to quickly look at what uh, from 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 different angles, right? What, what what phases we went through and where we're going. So the crawling phase. How did how did we manage wallets and key management? We allowed people to generate a paper wallet and then asked them to copy paste secret keys. And it was pretty normal that you'd lose access to a key every now and then. And, and user and, and, and so end user and developer interaction was just, just hard. It was uh, kind of geeky, which was fine, right? So users had to jump through a lot of hoops. Developers had to like, learn new terminology. And uh, 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 there was no composability. There was no cross-chain experience. You were in a certain ecosystem. And that was your ecosystem. And then you'd even see things like tribalism still there today, getting less and less, thank goodness. But um, you didn't even worry about that. Onboarding users, on-ramping to Web3 environments, 
crawling phase five years ago. An absolute nightmare. Who here knows the lemon coin clip? I think most of us do. Still true to some degree today, where you have to sign up, you have to sign up at the weirdest exchanges and then send your government ID to a weird ass exchange. Or 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 you didn't have to send anything, right? And you could just do whatever you like. And you had to find a way to get your fiat to something else, to something else, to an exchange, and then you were in this ecosystem. Some of us were ready to do that. It was a, it was a nightmare. If, if you want to grow an ecosystem, it was a nightmare. Developer experience, there were tools out there, and they were relatively easy to use if you knew what you were doing and were interested in digging into this Web3 space. Um, so not the best experience for just any dev or user. And the, the typical user and target audience was then obviously crypto geeks, people wanted to be part of this ecosystem. And the paradigm, the dream, the focus, the, the narrative was be your own bank, right? Be your own bank and uh, be responsible for everything. And uh, it was a, a kind of anarchist vibe. Uh, we're not there anymore. We're, we're, we're walking right now. And you see that wallet and key management gets easier. We're not there yet. We're seeing hardware and software, hybrid solutions. We're seeing NFC solutions like tangent cards. We're seeing pass keys, which is not the answer, but a great start, right? Because pass keys then link to your uh, Google or Apple account, and we all know that they can be uh, a two-factor scam to hijack as well. So we're getting there, and there's a lot of focus on these areas. That's important. And user interaction is getting better. It's still not there yet, right? Five years ago, I would say, I, I, people would hear me say, we're going to build a wallet my mother can use. I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, my mother can't use what we've built today, not without me explaining it. So we're getting there. And you see, for example, Coinbase launching really user-friendly new wallet products. So the focus is there, and that's good, but it's not easy enough. Because still today, if I'm going to ask 20 people in a random environment, I'm going out into the city center of Amsterdam today, and I'm going to ask 20 people to install the average crypto wallet we use today, and I'm going to ask them to go through that without help and onboard in three minutes, zero, it's not going to work. So we're walking, but it's not good enough. Composability, cross-chain, that gets attention, right? We're at a cross-chain event today. So yes, we're, we're there. We realize things are going to be cross-chain interoperable. And uh, the dev experience tooling, it's getting better. I, uh, I actually like what I see when it comes to documentation and quick starts and 101s, and it gets easier to onboard. The terminology is still too extreme, right? If, if you have to install something with a weird name and then install another dependency with another weird name, and then if you fire this weird command, then look, you, you, you deployed smart contract, which is what we know, right? We're getting there. It's getting a lot better. Still have some steps to take. Typical target audience definitely changed. Uh, I think most of us are aware that we shouldn't target crypto geeks. We should target basically anyone. And what we're, what we're working on as an industry, as, as developers, as, as builders, is growing the space we're in. We're growing the crypto space. We are trying to attract more users to Web3. We're trying to attract more developers to Web3. And even companies are realizing that this is here to stay. So they're hiring Web3 expertise. But growing our space is hard. Scaling our current ecosystem from 200,000 monthly active users to 400,000 monthly active users takes a tremendous amount of energy. And we're not giving them the best user experience. And I think the, the paradigm, dream, focus, uh, shifts from, um, we're, we're slowly moving towards the, the running phase. We, we are now realizing that we should target more people, more, more like a larger audience, which is what we're working on. And um, we, we are discussing Web 2.5, Web 2, and integration between the two worlds. That's, that's what we're doing right now. And we're thinking about what we need to ship to make that work, which which is multi-chain, which is a better user experience. But now let's, let's go to running. Let's go to where we are going now and where we should want to be five years from now, right? This is, 
if, if I think about the next five years, this is where we should end up. And five years from now, how should we think about wallets and about key management? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this as a developer to developers, right? So this is an invitation. Think about this. What are we building? How are, how are we building things? Five years from now, what should a crypto wallet be? What should key management be? It shouldn't. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to realize we're using a specific wallet for a specific purpose. We shouldn't have to worry about key management. We should be guided through the process and the wallet should basically be where we want to be anyway. If, if we want to book something, a hotel room, and somehow the, the, the resources are living on a blockchain and my, the, the, the value I own, the payments are going over a blockchain, then why would we need a separate wallet? I'm already in the application of, I don't know, booking.com, a hotel, anything, a travel agency. Why should I have a separate wallet? It should be embedded. If, if we think about, so this is user, user interaction as well, right? So the, the user shouldn't have to worry about what rails they're using or what platform they're on or what multi-chain environment they signed into. If we think about developer interaction, just drop the entire Web3 stuff. We're building a payments product or we're building a resource reservation or we're storing something, we're storing public state. That's not Web3, that's not Web3 catering Web2 people, that's Web. If you think about composability, and cross and multi-chain environments, again, abstract it away. Why are we even worrying about what chain it runs on or what protocol it uses? I want to get something done. I want to build something for people. People want to use it. I should be able to do that in a few lines of code without having to worry about the underlying technology. Onboarding on-ramp. Right now, we're seeing widgets on-ramp widgets, depending on the risk appetite of certain parties. Maybe all I need is an email address and a phone number verification, and then for a low amount, I can continue using a credit card. That's a lot better, right? I don't, new users don't have to go through an exchange to on-ramp their first money or assets to the space. But five years from now, I don't want to see any onboarding widget anymore, right? Some people, some, some organizations, some regulated entities already know who I am. I already identified myself. They will probably be the ones offering me that on-ramp or they will meet, maybe, maybe be the data providers to another entity that can now interact with me. So five years from now, I, there shouldn't be an on-ramp anymore. You're installing an app, you're going through a few setup steps, that was your on-ramp. That's where we should go. Dev experience, tutorials available, all those things. Again, don't, don't, don't try to fit Web3 into Web2 narrative. Uh, if, if you want to um, make your first payment or receive your first payment through Stripe, we all know how easy that is, right? If, if Stripe accepts you, right, and all the other, but let's, let's say you enter their sandbox and you want to receive a credit card payment, 10 lines of code, you can copy paste and you receive your first payment. So again, that's what we should do as an industry. That's, that, that should be our goal. It should be that easy. And a paradigm dream focus from here to uh, five years from now. And I think five years from now, I think, I think all of this summarized just means that uh, we have to go back to the title of my presentation. We should work on the blockchain no one knows about. I'm not referring to no one knowing about the XRPL or blockchain in general. I'm referring to the fact that we succeed as an industry if no one knows we're there. So that's what we should work on. I think true success for this entire space means that we completely abstract ourselves away. So I wanna challenge all of you. Don't build the next crypto product. Don't build the next Web3 product. Make things easier, abstract things away. Work with businesses, work with users, not with Web1 or 2 or 3 people. 
If you want to organize a meetup, organize a meetup for developers, not for the Web3 audience. And build clear APIs, build clear documentation, no fancy terminology, make things boring. So don't build to grow our ecosystem, build for 8 billion people, build for the blockchain no one knows about.